Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today, I'm speaking again with uh, Wilfred Riley. Will is a professor of political science at Kentucky State. He's also an author. His books include The $50 Million Question, Taboo, Hate Crime Hoax, and he's got a upcoming book in the next couple of months, uh, Lies My Liberal Teacher Told Me. Hey, Will, thanks for coming back. Of course. Glad to, glad to be on the program. So without giving away too much from the book, what lies were we told? Well, quite a few of them. I mean, the the whole point of the lies my liberal teacher told me book uh, available on, on Amazon at fine bookstores near you right now. But uh, the whole point of it is that we, for a long time in kind of American up middle class culture, have had this entire genre of texts that have kind of focused on the idea that you've been lied to. So there's Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, where he argues that the, the traditional curriculum leans to the right and it ignores the accurate Marxist way of looking at the world. I mean, there's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which is supposedly an Indian history of the USA and of North America. I mean, there are really four or five of these. I mean, there's the 1619 Project curriculum, so on. And the theme of all of them is like, you've been lied to by your conservative white or preppy black teacher. And in fact, American history is a long, dark period, which you were told was glorious. And the problem with this is that for anyone that's gone to public school, certainly in a city since like 1960, What's being criticized is really atypical. Like, that's not the experience most people have had. The experience most people have actually had with media, with education, so on, is that that's been run heavily from the political left for, again, decades now. I mean, in the, the professoriate's been more than 60% liberal since the 20, 30 years before rape. So in reality, when I look through high school textbooks, because I actually did with, I think, better methodology, what some of these other books have done, like Lies Your Teacher Told You, that one's pretty similar methodology. But when I look through textbooks now, I find mostly things in the other direction, like Native Americans were a peaceful people who were brutally genocided by white invaders. Uh, you know, slavery is America's original sin. That's something you're almost legally mandated to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, worse here than anywhere else in the world. You know, um, the Red Scare is something that's talked about constantly, as though Americans just started panicking about Russians under the bed. There was no real basis for that. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, for an inexplicable reason, we saw white flight and middle class black flight out of the cities. Must have just been racism. We can't we can't figure out why that was, but let's penalize the suburbs now. And I go through and actually read some history and, and kind of respond to this. I mean, so the Native Americans, you know, great warriors, great poets, but were some of the deadliest fighters in history. Like the war with the whites was mutually brutal. It lasted 400 years. There are more Indians alive now than there were probably when Columbus got here, at least in North America. You know, the great tribes still negotiate with the government. Navajo reservations bigger than many states. But more to the point, I mean, I go into Aztec culture, Sioux culture, why the wars were so brutal on both sides. Slavery, I actually just give a history of that. That's pretty heavily indebted to Thomas Sowell, the triple OG, but that just goes down through history. I mean, one of the first five human words was slave. You know, at least words that we have in writing. It's the Sumerian glyph for like man from the mountains, but he lost. So it's a guy standing in front of his beloved mountain homeland with like his hands chained. You know, so I, I start to talk about all this. Uh, the Red Scare thing. I mean, as a political scientist, you're expected to take a look at the what are called the Venona Cables, which are actually lists of the Russian agents that were in the United States during the 1950s. And I mean, I, I asked, you know, a couple of sources, are you comfortable with me just listing these? I mean, for that matter, they're on Britannica or Wikipedia. And I mean, so those are in the book. It's in the list of 200 names of the spies. So everyone, uh, Alger Hiss, all these guys that were presented as heroes that were being accused for no reason they were all actually russian agents and we know that because they had russian code names like hard wolf like they were just legit full-on spies so i mean just a lot of stuff oh and the last thing white flight and i broke my rule of only give three examples and don't yap on about mm -hmm. them too much but uh that's again one of those narratives that is of course there was racism in the 60s 70s a lot of whites and blacks hated each other but the reason people fled cities like detroit that had been integrated for cincinnati that had been integrated for decades in the north was that something had changed and that was the level of crime the level of rioting very often from whites there the level of violence that was allowed after the changes we made to the legal system during the great society so we kind of created this whole schema 
to cover up something that actually happened due to actual policy choices that were mostly made on the left. And I think that example is very relevant to today, where, I mean, my hometown of Chicago, America's second or third city, uh, United States second or third city, um, I mean, our population went from a little under 3 million to, I think, 2.6 million right now, 2.67 million. And it's hard to imagine that crime and our COVID policy and so on didn't have a lot to do with that. I mean, uh, New York is a bit of a bigger city, but has suffered a similar kind of reduction in population with people just fleeing the city. So, yeah, that is that is there. Okay, I mean, there's a lot there, but I just want to clear something up because I thought your book was forthcoming. Is it out and available right now to get? Or sorry about that. You can pre-order it. Um, okay. You can get an e-copy to your device, but it's not going to like open until a date certain. The What happened with the book, and I don't think the publisher has any problem with me saying this, is that there were multiple potential publication dates for it. And I mean, to some extent, possibly me turning the copy back in late or something like that contributed to us going with the later date. I mean, I'd have to check with legal and so on. But that was initially scheduled to come out um, this past winter, basically. Then we had a date scheduled that was like March, but there wasn't much point to that. So we scheduled it at the start of kind of the summer reading season. It's coming out at the end of May. Uh, if you go over to Amazon, you'll see it. You'll see the final release date. It's late May, or early June. And okay. that's it. I mean, so uh, it's, it's coming out now. Yeah, okay, that's good. What is it? It's mid-March. Yeah, so it, it's, where it's, it's gone its way out pretty soon. Yeah. I just want to make sure I wasn't wrong with that. But yeah, like a lot of what you were saying there, because I remember, okay, myself growing up i was in canada now we didn't get a horrible horrible picture but we didn't also get a rosy picture it was more of a balanced thing like this is what happened some of what happened with like the natives or the first nations or whatever that was maybe a little bit more heavy-handed of about how we wiped them all out and stuff because canada doesn't have slavery don't didn't have any of that um but now it's like, I mean, I think you wrote about it. Like now it's, you know, we're a genocidal country. Then you're, we're still talking about, you know, uh, hidden graves or, or, or missing, you know, missing graves of kids and stuff like that. And there's no proof of any of that. Yeah, the, the whole Native American thing is actually pretty complicated. So, I mean, first of all, I guess I would go back a very long way and say I, I'm far from convinced that ultimate morality exists at all in the sense of a set of rules overseen by the gods that humans have largely agreed on. I mean, that that's one of the greatest debates in philosophy, and the evidence for the position is pretty weak, uh, unless you're a religious divine. So, I mean, to some extent, it's stupid in the first place to criticize people for following kind of different rules or an older way hundreds of years ago. I mean, the Native Americans and Canadians, like Cree, as I understand it, from Canada, I mean, some of the, the great tribes, were legendary warriors and conquerors. I mean, by the time the, the horse and metal arrived on the plains, I mean, the Plains Indians were probably better than the Mongols. They're the best light cavalry in history. So, I mean, the idea that there was something immoral about fighting wars against these people when both the Scots-Irish and Black and so on knew Americans and the Plains Indians had never followed any other rule that's just pure presentism. I mean, like, none of the people involved in those wars would have thought anything of the kind at all. Rape was common as a weapon of war on both sides. People were scalping each other and making necklaces out of their enemies' teeth and so on. So to take these modern concepts like the genocide of forced education in another language, which I've heard Matisse native activists talk about now, and kind of put them onto literal cowboys and Indians running battles is just idiotic. I mean, so that that would be the first point about, you know, were these wars genocidal? Well, by our standards, I mean, it, when people are saying there's a genocide in Gaza because the enemy is not delivering them enough food, you know, I mean, like, yes, both the whites and the natives would be genocidal. But that's not the standard for genocide that was really used anywhere in the world until modern revisions of international law, which are idiotic, by the way. I mean, the chair of the UN Human Rights Commission is invariably a country like Iran or Sudan. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think that's the first point, like the, the frame doesn't make any sense at all. But a, a more technical point, when I talk to actual academic historians about this, I mean, no, uh, conventional form genocide, unless you're talking about very specific tribes on the East Coast, did not occur. I mean, the primary killer of Native Americans in what became the USA and Southern Canada was disease. I mean, so you had the these people that were coming over with these old world disease germs that come from close proximity with animals. 
and you were infecting these these warrior tribesmen that didn't have domestic animals except the dog. I mean, that didn't live in concentrated cities except along the Mississippian Valley and so on. So, I mean, uh, when the actual Spanish knights or English uh, pirates or whatever, I mean, whatever you want to call these people, these adventurers, these buccaneers in 1610 and so on were going inland, they were often walking through these Golgothas of bones. Like they were finding, you know, stone or copper built, but fairly advanced towns. I wouldn't call them cities, but they were just completely abandoned. They were being reclaimed by the woods. You, you were stepping on skulls in the what had been roads, and you were wondering what had gone on. What had gone on is that the forerunner of modern civilization, kind of the first horseman of the apocalypse, was riding ahead of the Westerners. And that's what actually took out most of the natives. By the way, the natives, last, last line for me, I'm a, I'm a lengthy talker. But the, uh, the natives also gave the world tobacco, syphilis, and cocaine. So, I mean, like, if you want to talk about, like, seriously, if you want to talk about these historical atrocities, like, oh, my God, we gave them the plague. Well, yes, but they gave us cancer. I mean, so this is, the, like, that's the real Moctezuma's revenge. You know, five million people die every year. It's not that you might shit when you eat tacos. But, I mean, that, that whole thing, like, that that question of who's more responsible, we white and black and Middle Eastern um, incomers, for transmitting the, these old world disease germs or the natives who came from, a, in many ways, a much more sophisticated botanical tradition for giving tobacco, coke, so on to the world, uh, hemp as well, I believe. I mean, it's a meaningless question. You have no moral liability for the the unintentional actions of your distant ancestors, I guess is how I'd phrase that. Yeah, no, I mean, but that's where... I think something like, okay, obviously I haven't read your book, but that's something that I think like, you know, lies my teacher told me or in your case, like my, my liberal teacher told me, you can kind of see why a bunch of students would, you know, approve of Osama bin Laden. Like, you know, oh, yeah. You, yeah. you mean in the context of believing that the West is absurdly evil and so everyone yeah. that fights us is good? Yeah, in that. And then or Israel's the oppressor and Hamas is the oppressed, and, you know, and like excusing rape and slaughter of like twelve hundred people. Um, it, it's things like that. Like there is the one today. Um, she well, it happened at Cambridge Trinity College. I don't know if you saw the little clip. She threw paint on a picture, oh, and, yeah. and and then then tore the picture up. Now, it's only someone who doesn't value their own history. You know, they don't value, like, if you're from the West, it's, I see that a lot now, and I, I, you know, I don't want to sound like an old man, but it is a lot in the younger generation where they don't value what, what we have here. And that will lead them to, like, I, I think it's worse in Canada than the U.S., but... You know, Canada Day, oh, we don't need that. Well, we're a genocidal country, you know, blah, 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 like all this stuff. We, should, we shouldn't celebrate Canada Day. And it's, we're changing our national anthem. It was um, our home in native land to our home on native land. Is that a joke? No, it's not a joke. It's it's they they want really. They, so they're changing the the Canadian <laughs> national anthem. I mean, that's a that's a song on par with the American national anthem. They're changing it to our home on native land. Yep, that's absolutely fucking insane. Yeah, no, they've they've already started singing it at hockey games like that. So it's that that that's my concern about a lot of this is people aren't going to know what. And I'm not saying that we didn't have propaganda and we didn't have you know BS taught to us, but I think we had a more fair accounting of what it was. Yeah, I I think I actually didn't have a lot of propaganda taught to me. Like I went to a functional kind of working class minority school with kind of upper middle class minority and white teachers. And I think they taught it pretty straight, actually. So I, I think very often when you have one of these debates where it's kind of like me or you as the center right guy, the rhino or the normie lib, and then there's a crazy communist, because you're not really going to see like crazy communist versus like, you know, my old debating opponent, Jared Taylor, that the equivalent's never going to happen on MSNBC, right? But so very often, if it's me or you talking to the crazy commie, what we're saying kind of just is true. Like, I'm not at all alt-right. I don't yeah. deny that, you know, again, I don't I don't think God's going to judge people for this, but, you know, slavery should be illegal. I'll take that radical position. 
you lost a war. You don't have to hoe the other guy's beans for 23 years or whatever anymore. I mean, but there's that. And then there's the other person that's attacking that and saying that what really is needed is Marxism and that the centrist who's presenting the truth is a teller of falsehoods. And you very often wind up in this weirdo Bernie Sanders position where the middle ground is between full on communism, at least in academia, in these kind of settings, and the center right. In reality, like you would be the middle ground. And that's what that's what most of my teachers were. I mean, they would say at the time, someone might even might even still use the word savages for an Indian raid where there were 80 rapes. But you would hear that the Native Americans were great fighters, surprisingly sophisticated when it came to plant breeding, so on. But you would also hear that the there were a bunch of probably they didn't have wheels, for example. You know, cannibalism wasn't infrequent. And you'd hear about white and native atrocities. The Alamo story is always told that way, a great heroic uh, defense by the whites. But in the end, they lost because of military incompetence and were wiped out by Santa Ana. No one who hears that thinks that Santa Ana is an incompetent general or that Davy Crockett was a bad man. You think you're hearing history just the way it actually was. I'm kind of rambling here, but I think what I what the the lessons you would learn in a suburban Toronto classroom in 1998 were probably pretty close to accurate. I don't think those teachers were a pack of Nazis, but I also don't think that they were saying nonsense, like this entire country was built by Native Canadians. Yeah. So what we've done is move more toward nonsense on the left, I would say. Oh, okay, look, I'm not going to argue with you there. That That's one thing I've been pushing back on a lot is what's being taught to kids. And it's just, you know, it started in colleges, but now it's K through 12. And it's, you know, they're being given this really warped view of what it what it means to be a liberal Western democracy. And, you know, like, okay, that, that woman who was tearing up that painting, like I was halfway joking, but I was saying, send her to Gaza. Like that, that should be your punishment. I'm sorry. Like, I don't know what the worth of that painting is. It's an old painting. It's, you know, um, that was a guy actually who also fought for the rights of Arabs in whatever Israel, Palestine, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, they're tearing slice to open his picture because, oh, we want to have rights for the Palestinians. We want to have right. You know, it's, it makes no sense. I'm like, send her to Gaza. Like, I'm, sorry, I'm rambling here now, it, but for me, it's, it's the, the lack of the education and the lack of that history and the lack of that understanding. No, we shouldn't have slavery. No, we shouldn't wipe out people. But that's something we've learned. We shouldn't wallow in it. Like, we're the only like, liberal, like, enlightenment countries are the only places that will look back on our past and say, that was wrong and let's not do it again. I mean, the Saudis aren't doing that. The, the Chinese aren't doing that, you know, like Putin sure as hell isn't doing that. Like, you know, like they're not going back and saying, this is what we did wrong and we should do better this time. But it, it's come to the point where it's self-flagellation. Like, you know, we're all wearing hair shirts, like moaning about how bad we were. Yeah, I don't want to go into like a moral rant, but I basically think that what uh, Nietzsche called slave or prey morality is bad. I mean, and I think that Christianity on the monastic side has been inclined toward this kind of stupid shit, but wokeism takes kind of the worst of that Christian excess, removes God, and replaces the mythical with kind of the contemporary social systemic, and it's a thousand times worse. But, like, I don't think the highest value is empathy. Um, I don't think tolerance is necessarily always good. I mean, there was a much older, more functional code that you can call Stoicism or Bushido or whatever that in general encouraged people not to absolutely abuse non-enemies, but made the point that the things that allow you to support your own society and general human development are the most important. So strength, honor, bravery, what we'd now call IQ, so on. And I, I absolutely agree with this. Like someone might call this a fascist idea. I don't really care. But in fact, it's not. It's an idea that would have been shared by virtually everyone, uh, Locke and Hobbes and probably Rousseau, until pretty recently. And I guess what I'm saying is just the, the transition away from this toward this idiotic, 
kind of God replaced but soft morality, like certain things are just bad. And anyone that's ever done them in any context is bad. So our history is bad. That's completely worthless. Like at the most basic level, I would really debate whether certain things are bad in the ultimate sense that's meant. Uh, anthropologists tend to say there are about 12 absolute human universals. Like don't fuck children or your mother or don't eat man unless you're starving. And I would, I would agree with those should you be curious. But beyond that, I mean, the human rules regulating consensual combat among males, sexuality, drugs, treatment of enemies, so on down the line. Can you sell your body parts or sell yourself into bond servitude? Those have varied all across the map. So I'm not certain we know what the universals are in the first place. One. Um, two, we definitely don't agree on them across all societies in space and time. And it's really irrational to critique someone for being a moral member of their own society. Like, I enslaved defeated enemies, but I would never behave in an ungentlemanly fashion toward a woman. I mean, Thomas Jefferson would be amazed by OnlyFans or moms making pornographic videos with their daughters <laughs> and so on. So people have, I mean, just come on. Like, we, one of our first episodes, we talked about how just regular preppy Asian and black mothers would react to a lot of this crap. Oh, like, God. you know. Just like, but like just showing videos to like my Indian buddies and moms who spent a lot of time in the old country. What do you think of this? I mean, it would be just disgust, like gestures of a religious aversion and so on. So ultimates, there may be a few, probably not many. Societies don't agree on them. And at a third level, if you're commenting on someone whose morality you don't understand, whose acts you didn't yourself commit, there's no real reason to feel the kind of pervasive guilt that we see so often in our society. So actually, that was just a, a prelude. So my comments, I wrote them down, actually, on the Lord Belfour, uh, I believe, painting uh, attack. Uh, I think the first one would just be, you do have to have rules. So whether or not these are ultimate, within every society, you have to have standards or everything falls apart. If you can go into any gallery, the politics of which you dislike, and smear human shit on the art, you know, the some of the first things to be attacked will be feminist work by very pro-choice artists this kind of thing so for in order for everyone to be safe to a certain level you you need rules you obviously can't have people who feel passionately about some damned random political issue or other running into museums or into university libraries and defacing things like the 200 year old canvas of lord belfort um and you have to punish that when it happens that's I, that goes without saying they expelled this student by the way which i was surprised but glad to see Okay. Um, there's talk of pretty serious criminal charges. I think that'll happen. So hopefully, hopefully we're going to start making an example out of these people that are like sitting in the road or gluing themselves to the Mona Lisa or whatever. But I think the last point is why do people do this? And it, it's pretty much what you said. They've been told throughout their lives that our society is uniquely, unredeemably, irrevocably evil. And they've been told this in a way that's kind of a mixture of half-truths and bullshit. Like, my moral analysis explained why the truths are half-truths. But also other things, like other societies did the same stuff worse, That that's just left out. So people who've been shown not a clarified, cleansed view of the West, or even a warts-and-all view of the West, but sort of an all-warts view of the West, are, are in a rage constantly. And this is how they express that. What do we do? I mean, I, I think... To some extent, you have to just enforce the law, but you also have at a deeper level to almost reprogram, to kind of try to get truth into the minds of these people. And that's going to be difficult. Yeah, okay, There, there's what I've been trying to tell a few people now. Like, I've spoken to a couple of parents groups and stuff, and, you know, here they're like, oh, well, when we can vote Trudeau out, the next prime minister will fix things. I'm like, no one's coming to save you. This... It took a generation or so for us to get to this point. It's going to take us mm -hmm. a generation to get out of it. I mean, yeah, I agree. You've got thirty plus years of people graduating with an intersectional lens, and you know, there's not enough Starbucks jobs for them all <laughs> to take. Like, I, I, no, but what are you going to do with that? Really. You know, like, like put them all on well, welfare. Like, it's sort of. Um... Actually, I think that that is 
So there, there's a fairly deep question or a kind of complex situation there. I think the question of what to do with all these people with useless backgrounds, but upper middle class ones is what led to DEI and all that to some extent. I mean, like it, it really is. So did you see this thing online? I think the PhD student Zach Goldberg posted it. But the average IQ of someone with a four-year college degree is now 104. Yeah. yeah. 105. Something like that. Yeah, it's... Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the, the reason for that is that an incredible number of people go to college. Like 70% of white and black males go on to like real four-year university. And that's that's absurd. There's, there's no necessity for that in society. Maybe 10, 15% of jobs require a baccalaureate degree, maybe something like that. So there's been a question in business that I've seen while I was in business of what do we do with these people who come from families affiliated with our company or our clients who have a credential that we normally would respect, but who clearly don't know much of anything. I mean, close to 10% of graduates in the studies fields, sociology um, has some potential, but is very much slid into, into this kind of morass. What about the liberal arts, English, so on? So I think that one of the ways in which companies themselves and people that were entering the job market tried to create a foothold was to set up these things that relied on the crap that had been learned in the modern university. So like, we need a little more to do with human relations in this company. We need a department of diversity. That's an actual thing now. Senior VPs of diversity are very common, you know, so on down the line. And the problem with all of this is that it's just useless. It it doesn't do anything. If you're a company and your bottom line is selling men's athletic shoes, diversity, I mean, you could do the alphabet soup almost like DEI, ESG, mm -hmm. SEL, new HR. None of that stuff is going to help you move more Kobe Bryant's. So you understand how it came to be. There's this incredible mass of people graduating from college. They have an average IQ that's 20 points below what it used to be. And for practical reasons, I mean, you don't want to be out of compliance with the diversity laws with the Civil Rights Act. You're going to have to hire a lot of them. What do you do? And I, I think that's where you saw the world of fake work develop. And it's not just woke stuff, by the way. Like, did you ever watch that? Uh, I think it's an Instagram video like my day at work in Facebook marketing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that. It was just, it was ridiculous. Well, like the young woman, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The young woman comes into the office and gets a bowl of fresh fruit and like goes into her meditation cubicle and <laughs> like walks around to the ping pong tables and all that. Like we're talking about the same video, I think. Yeah. That's, that's the one. No, but, but it's okay. It's not just that. It's so, okay. The IQs have been lowering, but I was just looking into some of this right now and it was not only is the IQs being lowered, but they're artificially higher than what they would have been 20 years ago because the test isn't the same as anymore. They took out some vocabulary sections. They took out, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember the, like two of the sections that they took out, if they put them back in, the test results would be even lower or that, sorry, that might be the SATs. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah. yeah. The, so we're actually, it's kind of a weird situation because I read almost all of the IQ research so mm -hmm. I can debate both alt writers and, Hoteps who think that whites and Middle Easterners aren't actually human. And also so I can put some real citations in my, my own <laughs> academic work. And IQ is increasing. There, there's, there's been about a 0.5% drop very recently. But overall, I mean, if you read the post-Flynn effect literature, like, you know, 1995, uh, Charles Murray, building on the work of Jim Flynn, RIP <laughs> Jim Flynn, discovered that IQ tests were regularly renormed because the scores kept increasing. So I think this is Flynn 94, Murray 96 or something like that. The years can easily be off. But the final conclusion as they looked through years of these tests was that someone who got a 100 IQ in the late 1990s, and this persisted on until the late 20 teens, would have scored something like 116 on an older version, a 1950 version of the test. And questions about why this is are actually genuinely interesting. I mean, one of my radical assertions is that you obviously get better on tests if you study for them. So, I mean, I would assume that the level of training in society uh, recognized as that or not. I mean, things like playing sophisticated video games come to mind, but that's radically increased since the 40s or 50s. 
when a huge chunk of people still lived on farms. So IQ is actually fine. Uh, the black IQ, for that matter, is up. I mean, the last figure I saw for the black IQ was 91 or 92. So, I mean, below that, the tested score for whites. But, I mean, you have to adjust for the fact that more African-Americans live in the South, where test scores tend to be lower in general, you know, different income population, whatever. But the average for the world is 84. So the, the USA on actual WISC and similar uh, board tests are doing pretty well. But at the same time, we don't know how to do shit. I don't, I don't actually know exactly how we got onto this, but the real thing that you notice as a teacher is lack of competence when it comes to basic things like structuring paragraphs, solving math equations. And that's what explains the SAT. The, now, the SAT, that's not an IQ test, really. Scores mm -hmm. have been stable for decades, despite the fact that, yeah, we made the test a lot easier. So you have people that are potentially pretty smart these game-playing, phone-using, sapient people, Sudoku and Crossword and all that are games people play constantly, but they don't have the baseline of core Western knowledge that we all used to. So it's a two-sided problem there. Okay, I mean, the core Western knowledge, that's one thing, but another thing that you mentioned, like they can't structure a paragraph. You know, that's... That that should be something everyone's freaking out about, you know. Yes. What is it? Sixty five percent of people can't do math at grade level. I think for literacy, it's like seventy five or eighty five percent are illiterate. And there's there's some districts where it's you know a hundred percent can't do math, and it's like ninety five percent illiteracy and stuff like that. It's uh, you know it's ridiculous. Like that should be people should be freaking out about that, not about whether or not you know. Some moms want a book where a kids get a kids giving a, a guy a blowjob out of the library or not like that. That should not be. Who cares what books are in the library if the kids can't read? <laughs> yeah, that's a great line. I mean, I think Charles Love said that when we were talking to moms for liberty, like they kept saying, and there was a good call. Tiffany Justice is a fun person, a good lobbyist for yeah. cause. But I mean, she kept saying, well, I do think this book is obscene. I think this book is obscene. And when we were talking about some of these books, like these complex tales of battlefield atrocities or like the joy of sex, I mean, Charles looked at the camera and just asked, can the kids read these? And I, I think that's a very valid point. I don't know what <laughs> percentage of students in an eighth grade class are really going to sit down with the joy of sex and get through that. Um, Yeah, I don't, I don't really have a witty comeback there. The, the percentage rates... The way it's measured in the USA, is, as I'm sure you know, is that you have four categories. There's below basic, basic, proficient, which is where you'd expect 50-odd percent of people to be, and then advanced. And advanced is the gifted college prep category. And, I mean, the percentage below proficient, I found this out, actually, because people online a couple of years ago were consistently saying, you know, 75% of black students read at a basic or below basic level. And I found that a little embarrassing. I thought the claim might be false, but I went and looked it up. And that's true. But the catch is that 50% of white kids read at a basic or below basic level. Like the majority, the not no group other than maybe Asians has had a majority even proficient ever, like in, in the backlog 20 years that I've looked through. So, yeah, it's I, I think, I mean, you're right when you say, well, it's not esoteric Western knowledge, it's core stuff. But, yeah, the, the basic point is that IQ has not dropped, or at least has not dropped dramatically. I mean, these people that are solving these complex puzzles on phones to send fake digital gold coins to their e-girlfriend, they're not stupid. They just don't know how to do stuff in real life. And it, you really recognize this if you crack a math book, by the way. The way math is being taught today is, is insane. Okay, put in windshield wiper fluid. Mm -hmm. You know, something like that. Okay, you don't need to be a mechanic, but if you're going to drive a car, know how to fill up windshield wiper fluid. And it's stuff at that basic level. And I think, again, it gets down to everyone going to college. Okay, you don't need to go to a trade school to learn how to fill in wiper fluid, but no one's learning how to do just about anything. Like, yo, I'm not... I don't consider myself an electrician or anything like that, but, you know, I can change a light fixture, I, I, you know, little basic things. Right. But I don't, I don't see a 20 year old 
an average 20 year old, I don't think could change a light fixture, work on their brakes or change a tire. Even. I think, I think you'd have you know, f- problem finding that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's often true. I mean, here now here in Kentucky, most people can, can change a tire, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the things I most often see this with when I'm talking to younger mentees are like cooking, map reading. Yeah. And I mean, to some extent, I think that's because there's so many digital devices that can do the thing for you. I mean, for 10% more, you can buy food and put it in, you know, a fairly strong microwave and get something that looks like a cooked dish. I mean, there's GPS on your phone. I mean, the navigator has been out for 20 years. Like, you no longer feel you have to have the skill. And I'm going to get into one or two other uh, possible contributing causes, but I, I think that's a big one. Like, I remember when I was in high school, you know, back when Smilodon roamed the earth, like, <laughs> late 90s. Um, I remember even then, my teachers would say things like, you jackasses, you got to learn basic mathematics, times tables, division over the decimal. Like, you got to know this because you're not going to have a damn computer in your pocket when you walk around. You're not going to carry a Texas Instruments calculator with you in the store, are you? And, I mean, looking at my phone now, which is just a standard Android, I mean, it's got a calculator function that can do logs and so on. I mean, so that that turned out to be false, and people can take advantage of those products. But, like, one sentence apiece, I think two other things that contribute to the lack of basic skills are the single motherhood and divorce rate and the fact that the teacher population, this is one of those things you're kind of not supposed to say, but the teacher population has been really slumping in basic IQ terms recently. Um, so first, I mean, like we all know the figures it's, you know, 50% of kids, 70% of black kids don't really have a dad. I mean, dad, both on the birth certificate and in the home. I mean, so when you think of like what mom does and what dad does, if if you're missing one of those parents, you're going to lose a lot of skills and a lot of this stuff for men. I mean, even watching college basketball, I noticed that jump shots aren't as smooth as they used to be like that stuff. You spend years learning with your father, your uncles, your buddies at home. Um, I assume the equivalent for females, if you don't know how to cook, mom probably would have taught you that. The older ladies in the family, some of the men in the family might put you out on the grill. If you don't have those people, if you have a broken family and there are only eight people and they're not speaking, you you just don't pick up those skills. You know, school used to teach a few, but... No, oh, okay, I'm not saying that school has to teach these things. I, it was just, you know, there's a lack of just basic general knowledge. And, okay, look, I agree with you. I... have Okay, I work in IT. There's a lot of stuff that I need for my job, but I don't I don't have it memorized because you know what? I can Google that. Like, you know, it's not that I'm gonna go out and make a, a set of Ethernet cables, but if I ever need to, I've done it before, I know how to do it. But just to get the the order of the cables, I'm just gonna go on Google and look at it. But other certain things, um so whatever, I like to go camping, I like to go fishing. You know, go out with my buddies, and some of them, yeah, just completely rely on their uh, phone. I'm like, okay, we're going out in the middle of the woods. What if there's not a signal? Like, go, you know, no compass, no nothing. Like, I, I'm not going to go out in the woods without a compass and a map because you know the phone might not work. Like, you don't know where you, yeah, you know, you know what's going to happen. So it's just, yeah, you, know, you, you need that uh, preparedness. Yeah. Another thing, though, that I I didn't really get into there was, and I don't know how this tracks back more than 30 years, but one of the problems that has to contribute to this is that teachers do very badly on board and IQ tests in at least the recent period I've looked at. So, I mean, I can pull it up if if we really need to, but the average SAT for grade school and I think high school teachers was something like a 990. So you've got this weird situation where not only are families collapsing, but the people that are supposed to teach these skills to kids from every social class background at every level of potential often barely know them. So it, it's an entire weird situation. Like yeah. there are problems in American schools. It's just that funding isn't one of them. I mean, oh, yeah. one of them is teacher quality. One of them is the lack of discipline on the part of the students. This is probably especially true for minority students, unfortunately. But like a bunch of issues like that, the families that are feeding kids into the schools are often the very dysfunctional ones we're talking about. The schools themselves are, I mean, some of the best funded in the world. That that has nothing to do with the problem. No, oh, it's it's not the money, but okay, like with the teachers, I agree with you. But again, this is where my thing is. It started in the academy. And I don't know if you ever watched that uh, Peter Bogosian had done a series with, uh, I'm forgetting the guy's name. I think it was Asher. He was a professor. 
and he talked about the colleges of education and how then that goes, you know, so the teachers come out of there, the board administrators come out of there, the principals come out of there, and then they go back into the school system and they're being taught complete and utter nonsense. And, you know, like, it's just, they're being indoctrinated into the cult of woke and they're going out and that's all they know how to do. And so, you know, if it doesn't matter if Johnny can't read, uh, you know, little Billy didn't hand his homework. Well, it's restorative justice, right? So the like, it's there is a source, and it's coming from the universities, but then it's affecting a lot of other things because you know you want a chemist, you're going to go hire a chemistry PhD. You want a you know you want a teacher, you're going to get someone from co- who's got a certificate from a college of education. Things like that. It's it's so it's I always say that we're you know fight whatever fight you want to fight but if you don't look at the university and fix that it's a war of attrition that you're going to lose because you're going to keep pumping out people and eventually anyone who knows any better is going to have died off yeah i mean so what what would your solution be to the university issue i'm i'm curious because i'm i'm going to comment on that obviously but i i'm always i've been talking a lot about this recently with people like chris rufo and i mean it's it's a tough nut to crack because Look, of the tenure system, because of how how long these people have been in there, what what do you think? Okay, first and foremost, the faculty need to get a spine. I'm sorry. Okay, you know I'm going to very generalize here, uh, but for the most part, academics are bookish, cowardly people, and it unless it <laughs> no, but but that's what that's what they are. They don't want confrontation. You know, so they're not going to say anything unless it affects them. Straightforward, like outright so they have to get a spine and stand up second get rid of all the dei all that other garbage get it out of the administration um but you're going to need legislation like all these people who are oh academic freedom this that i'm sorry the academy broke its trust they were supposed to do you know they had a they had a mission they failed on that mission so you're going to need legislation now if you want to help them form that legislation, if you want to do it as best as possible, maybe it's legislation along the lines of, if you don't get rid of DEI, you're going to lose funding. You know, if you use any, like, I mean, a perfect example was Princeton. When their president put out that statement about how racist Princeton is and Trump's uh, <laughs> education department was going, yeah. to, was going to investigate it, they should have carried through with that investigation. Like, you know, you say you're racist. Well, why do you say you're racist? What's the me- what are the metrics you're using? So that's where I think that needs to come in. But it it has to, you need people on the inside as well. You need you know presidents and administrators with a backbone, and you need faculty to stand up and say enough's enough. Like we can't you know you're gonna obviously you're gonna have the woke teachers and the woke administrators and whatever pushing back the other side, but you can't be cowardly and. I think people need to be honest. Like, okay, there's someone I respect, Nicholas Christakis. Uh, okay. I, I I don't know him. I I know of him. I've you know I've heard him speak. I've read some of his stuff. Respect the guy. But right when the the everything happened after October seventh and all these campuses, people were protesting and stuff. He put out a tweet how about how he saw for twelve years all these DEI programs come in, you know, and these kids have to go through this mandatory training, and it was counter to their civil rights. So I was pretty pointed about it. I'm like, well, what did you do? You know, so you yeah. you watched it happen for te- you know whatever twelve years, and you did nothing. He's like, oh yeah, I've done, I've done all kinds of things. I'm like, did you? Did he help one student file a civil rights complaint? Yeah. If he saw it for twelve years, and he you know he was at well when he left Princeton, he was the master of Stillman College, like so he had a high up position, like right around the time he left when you know his wife had the the Halloween costume thing, that whole kerfuffle there right so these people have to be honest about what they did and what they didn't do stop making yourself out to be something you weren't and i mean i get it i get why people didn't want to speak out you're afraid of losing your job this and that but now it now it rests on like moms for liberty it rests on like average everyday people to go back and try to fix this which you know a christakis or a pinker basically saw happening over the last 20 to 30 years and you know all, all all as far as i can tell all they did was write a sternly worded letter 
you know, it's so I mean, I, I know I didn't give much of an answer, but it's like I said, you need the teachers, you need the administrators, and you need legislation. If you don't have all three, or you need to do what they're doing down in Austin, um, you know, like uh, again, I think it's Peter Bogosian, Barry Weiss, I can't remember who else is all involved in that, you know, get new institutions or try to fix what's there. Frankly, I'm very pessimistic if anything can be fixed. I, I just think it's it's so far gone. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. So the actual problem is a really pretty obvious one. I mean, after decades of this stuff going on, there's a real entrenchment issue on the campus. Like, I mean, we've all seen these numbers, but in both academia and the media, the left-right split isn't 70-30 even. It's like 93-7. to 7. So, I mean, there are entire colleges like Harvard, where there are four conservative professors in the place and so on down the line. Yeah. So it it's difficult to get into that system and radically reshape it quickly. I, I think that the second thing you said, which is lawfare and legislation, is probably going to be the way this would actually work. I mean, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the follow-up uh, precedent mm -hmm. cases, I mean, cover and protect Caucasians or men as much as any other group. So to some extent, people are going to have to start standing up and risking small but real personal risk of harm and saying like, hey, this is wildly illegal. And I mean, to, that's basically what you saw in fair admissions. I mean, yeah. a group of students came forward and said there's no practical way that as the Asian American population grows and our scores remain at level X, what you actually see in Harvard and in elite public U admissions could be going on without extraordinary racial bias. And they they won that case. So I think it's going to take plenty of cases like this. Like is a Title IX policy that says that only men can be rapists discriminatory? Almost certainly, yes. Although the standard for male, female uh differences in treatments, just intermediate review, but just any of this different stuff, I mean, it, it is the follow-up is what the universities are going to replace affirmative action with, which is going to be mm -hmm. not race, but like tear jerking stories about racism. Like, is that constitutional? Mm -hmm. You're just going to have to go blow by blow by blow and pull them out of the hole. And it's going to be an ugly fight. I mean, so like the thing is, like you, been, you mentioned, Mom, have, you've talked to some of the people from Moms for Liberty, right? Uh, no, I've never spoken to any of them. I mean, I've spoken to like parents defending education and a couple okay. others. Yeah, PD is pretty good as well. But I mean, like, the, they really are just like mostly affluent, probably fun after a couple of glasses mm -hmm. of wine, like suburban mobs. Like, if you go to the mm -hmm. Mobs for Liberty convention, it's got kind of a yoga ski resort feel to it. I mean, they know what they're doing politically. But it's just, it's just these, these women that are there with their friends getting ready to, getting ready to take on the system. And that's great. I love that kind of democratic politics. I'm not trying to be patronizing the women over mm -hmm. men or whatever. But I mean, because of that, as they go up against these slippery experts in these fake fields, you're going to see uh, as much wordplay and manipulation as possible every time a bill gets close to passage. So like the, all these bills that say you can't in your university can't contain any office known as the DEI office that teaches any DEI, ESG, et cetera. Like people are just going to call the, the same office, something like the racial comedy office. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a, like, yeah. not a brilliant, but yeah, it's, it's going to be constant trickery. Like in the 1990s, this was political correctness and PC became a joke and they made PCU where they were barbecuing yeah. spotted owls and all this. So then it became something else. It becomes, you know, total quality and race relations, and then it becomes DEI and so on. So it's it's going to be a long fight as people sue and try to winkle out all this stuff against this very entrenched bureaucracy. Okay, on that, I agree with you because it is very slippery, but one of the ways legislation can work is instead of saying no DEI, <laughs> it's if you if you want any of these things, they have to follow like enlightenment values. You got to follow like, you know, this methodology to prove your point if you're going to do something so if you're going to do something where you you know split people up by race where you do stuff like that where you uh you know where you villainize one race and you know like white people are all evil if you put it in of what you can't do and you do it on a values based instead of saying no dei 
then they can't just rename it and then just you know bring in something else, right? They can't bring in a Trojan horse. I, I, I mean, I think that would work. Um, I know the time is coming up and you got you to get going, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. But if you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you, um, like I said, I'll put uh, the links to where they can pre-order your book in the uh, in the description. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, just as a, as a final comment on that, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, and if you look at the better bills that are fighting against mm -hmm. this, like Florida's bill, they very explicitly do this. I mean, they say, you know, by DEI, we don't mean a program that's referred to as a diversity, equity and inclusion program. We mean any program that ascribes immutable characteristics to the races on the basis mm -hmm. of genetics, past oppression, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Um, that that calls some groups privileged relative to others, that separates groups in segregated public facilities. Like, it's actually quite good. And as you read through it, it's kind of like the Ryan Long wokes v. racist routine. <laughs> like, almost everything in the bill sounds like it would also work against the Klan or the Panthers 50 years ago. Like, yep. you can't have a housing unit for one group, so on. So that, <laughs> that I think, is going to be the 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 way it, it's done and i'm i'm actually fairly positive about the potential effects of lawfare i mean it it obviously at some level is not legal to do some of this stuff uh, there was a good wall street journal uh op-ed just a couple of days ago like in the face of potential lawsuits you know the street is opening up their coveted internship programs for minorities because at some level it's clearly not legal to have a program called the cleopatra fellowship that provides a quarter of your intern that's only for black women so it, it was just sort of there was a social mm -hmm. convention around people not attacking this mm -hmm. but i think that's fading for whites and i also think it never existed for asians cubans middle easterners brazilians who aren't considered hispanic even though many of them are black any of these groups so they're, they're that puts a limit on the time frame within which this can continue um in terms of your last question where can people uh find my book the easiest way to find anything from me really actually is just to google me so i'm wilfred riley w-i-l-f-r-e-d-r-e-i-l-l-y on a good old gaelic name and a rare one <laughs> and so i mean if if people see that, they'll get my website, which is just an adjunct to the university website. You know, my Twitter, Facebook, if that's your thing. You know, I'm I'm over uh, 35 and I went to college. You know, <laughs> but just all that stuff, my my writing uh, as a National Review columnist, so on. The book itself is available on Amazon. It's called A Lies My Liberal Teacher Told Me. And apparently we have quite a few pre-orders in uh, already. I'd, I'd love to get some more. So go check that out. All right. Well, thank you very much, Will. It was great speaking to you again. And thanks, everyone, for listening. And I'll be back.